ladies and gentlemen. It gives us immense pleasure to welcome everyone present here to the final round of arguments for the 30th MC Chagla Memorial Na Government Law College National Moot Court Competition 2023. I'd like to request the audience to kindly put their phones on silent and maintain decorum. I am honored to welcome Honorable Judges of the Bombay High Court, Honorable Shri Justice Kamal Khata and Honorable Shri Justice Milin Sathe, who will be presiding over the final round of arguments this evening. I would like to request the Honorable Judges and finalists to commence with the final round of arguments. We look forward to a competitive and enthralling round. Collectively, as your honours during the course of this proceeding. <coughs> Much obliged, your honours. If your honours are well versed with the facts of the case in the present matter, I seek to move on with regards to the issues for consideration before this bench today. Your honour, there are three contentions that the petitioners raise before this honourable bench today. First is that the ban carried out with regards to the application of crisscross by the Union government is in violation of Articles 14, 19, and 21 of the Constitution. The second issue is that the suspension of internet services carried out by the state of Pitpit is illegal and arbitrary in nature. And the last issue deals with the actions of the state government of Pitpit being violated of basic human rights, which is something that the respondent state has failed to address in their written submissions. I shall be dealing with the first issue, while my co-counsel shall be dealing with the last issue. Your Honours, it is the petitioner's contention that the app ban carried out by the Union government is in violation of the three limbs of the Golden Triangle of the Constitution. With regards to the first limb under Article 14, this court in Anwar Ali Sarkar has recognized that any state action to be compliant with the Equality Court under Article 14 must pass the muster of two tests. First is the test of reasonable classification and second is the test of non arbitrariness With regards to the reasonable classification test, Your Honour, this court in State of Gujarat versus Ambika Mills that held that the singling out of an entity from similarly placed entities can only form a reasonable classification if there exists some real or substantial differentiation. In the present case, Your Honour, it is a contention of the petitioners that the singular ban is an under-inclusive classification, thus violates the reasonable measure under Article 14. Your Honour, if I could draw two circumstances from the proposition to show how the application that was banned was similarly placed to other social media applications that was prevalent in the state of Ampro. If Your Honour is to turn to page 2, paragraph 5 of the proposition. Similarly placed, given the nature of the content that they carry, as well as the reach that they had. If your honours will also refer to page 4, paragraph 15 and 16 of the case record in the present case. Your honour, it should be noted that the tokri that was posted by Mr. Gautam, the reach of it and the virality of it was further expanded by the presence of other social media apps. Thus, if the state's objective was to prevent the further deterioration of public order in the state of Pitpit, it must have carried out a ban of all the social media apps. Hence, 
this feasible classification does not pass the muster of achieving a legitimate objective to a rational nexus. If there are no further queries with regards to the first <coughs> test under Article 14, I seek to move on to the test of arbitrariness. This court, in Shaira Banu, held that there must be an adequate determining principle to make sure that there has been a proper application of mind on the part of the state when any state action is taken. This adequate determining principle must be specific and definitive and cannot be weighed. Your Honor, if I could draw an analogy at this point. The executive order that was issued by the President of the United States banning TikTok, which is an analogous app to Chris Cross in the present case, was in pursuance of an FBI investigative report. The Senate Intelligence Committee had carried out a thorough scrutiny by consulting the relevant stakeholders, only then was the ban issued. There was a legitimate and a definitive determining principle of national security implications as well as data privacy of the users of that particular application which necessitated the ban. In the present case, Your Honor, merely relying on the source of positive <coughs> intelligence, the union government of AMPRO has carried out the ban. Why? It is an accepted proposition of law that matters of national security are normally built beyond the providence of the court when it comes to judicial review. The application of that intelligence in further sta state action, if disproportionate, can be st struck down by this court under its power of judicial review. And this was held <coughs> so by the Supreme Court in the famous Rafael judgment, Manohar Lal Sharma versus Narendra Modi. Your Honours, that brings me to an end of my submissions with regards to the first limb of Article 14. If I may move on to the second limb of Article 19. Dr. Ambedkar had recognized Article 19 to be the cornerstone of Part 3 of the Constitution because it granted six important freedoms to the citizens of India. It is a petitioner's contention that two such freedoms have been abridged in the present case. First is the freedom of speech and expression under Article 19 1A and second is the freedom to practice one's profession or occupation under Article 19 1G. Moving on to the first prong with regards to the freedom of speech and expression, it is the contention of the petitioners that the ban is not in consonance with the spirit of this provision. This court, right from S. Rangarajan up to Subramanian Swami, has recognized the idea of dissent and criticism to be an integral part of this provision. Your Honor, if I may direct the court's attention to paragraph 18 and the first line of paragraph 19 on page 5 of the proposition. Your Honor, the proposition has been provided by the organizers and it is not part of the written submission for the uh, record of the facts. Here. Yes, Your Honor. Page 5, paragraph 18, and paragraph, first line of paragraph 19 shows that this ban was carried forward by the Union government in furtherance of the widespread criticism that the government had faced due to the failure of the Due to the widespread criticism that the government had faced 
on two grounds. One for its divisive policies and two for the failure of the government to manage the fallout that the state of Tibet had faced due to the invasion of Manchow. Thus, this ban is not in consonance with the spirit of Article 191A. Your Honours, the responding state may contend that this ban is necessitated due to false information of fake news that was prevalent in social media, which is furthering the public order situation in Tibet. This court had observed during the proceedings of Kunal Kamra versus Union of India while adjudicating on the constitution validity, fact-checking units set up by the central government, that though misinformation constitutes low-value speech, it is still protected under Article 191A, provided that it is not to be proscribed under any of the eight thresholds mentioned under Article 19.2. Which brings me to my argument on the 19.2, Your Honour. The respondent state may contend that this restriction was reasonable on the ground of public order. But it is important to understand that we are faced with the situation of law and order. This court in Gujarat, Mazdu Salah had drawn a fine distinction between these two terms. Public order has a higher degree or a higher threshold characterized by aggravated form of violence, whereas law and order are those commissions which are of purely of local significance. In the present case, Your Honor, the interstate communal rights that happened between the two religious communities was largely restricted to the northern part of the state itself. Even the other parts of the state weren't affected by this particular communal right that had ensued in the state. Thus, since, as held by this court in caution to show, a right of free speech can only be restricted along the lines of the eight grounds mentioned in Article 19.2, and those eight grounds are exhausted, and the state cannot bring in law and order as an additional ground to restrict free speech. Even if your honours consider this situation to be one of public order, not of law and order, this court, in the Ramanur lawyer judgment, had held that any speech to be proscribed on the ground of public order must pass the test of a calculated tendency to intentionally cause animosity between two or groups. In the present case, Your Honour, as referred to in paragraph 16, as well as paragraph 15 of the fact sheet on page 4, there is nothing prima facie to show that there was an intentional cause of posting the tokeni by Mr. Gup, Mr. Gautam to cause further public disorder in the state. Thus, this speech cannot be proscribed on the grounds of public order given the state not fulfilling the criteria of calculated tendency. Moving on to my arguments under Article 19.1G, Your Honor, the Bombay High Court in the Monaco Limited vs. Abhijit Bansali case had held that social media influencers not only receive income for the content that they post, but also make content which influences public perception and the socio-economic choices of their followers, and hence can rightly be accorded protection as a class of professionals under Article 19.1G. Your Honor, if I could draw your court's attention to paragraph 12 and paragraph 13 of the proposition on page 4. Here it should be noted that crisscrossers as a class of social media influencers received income as well as made content on critical government policies which could have a large impact on public perception. Thus, they fulfilled the test that the Bombay High Court had laid down in the Malaku judgment. None of the respondents gave me content that this particular restriction was in larger public interest under Article 196. But this court had held that if a particular measure is not the least drastic measure, then it does not pass the muster of public interest. Your Honor, the state has two concerns here. One is the objectionable content, and second is the alleged data tra illegal transmission that the proprietor company OGL was involved in. With regards to the objectionable content, there existed a lesser effect, lesser restrictive, but a more effective measure, such as the central government issuing takedown notices under Section 69A, specifying the content which caused the further public disorder in the particular state. With regards to the alleged illegal data transmission by the company, with the recent enactment of the Personal Data Protection Act, the central government could have made a reference to the Data Protection Board under Section 27. The investigation could have taken place and a fine could have been levied on the data fiduciary. These were lesser drastic but more effective measures which the state failed to take into account. Yes, sir. So, if you 
that any criticism of government policies does not serve as justification to restrict the exercise of freedom of speech and expression under Article 19.8. Even if a restriction is to be imposed, Your Honours, it can be done under Article 19.8 under the ambit of public order. Your Honour, keeping the concept of public order in mind, we see the concentric circle formulation as provided by Justice Vidya. It essentially divides state action into three concentric circles. First, that of law and order, which is of much local nature, that is restricted to the state's territory itself, and is in the most outermost circle, followed by public order, which is of much higher degree. Therefore, a situation that affects law and order does not necessarily affect public order. Your Honor, in the current case, we see the proposition. The incidents that began in May 2023 was simply intermittent in nature, following which the communal clashes that occurred were restricted to northern Fitbit and not the whole of it. More importantly, Your Honor, if we see page 2, paragraph 7 of the proposition, Your Honor, essentially, 
certainty is one of the main aspects that an ordinary citizen should have. In the case with which Barry was speaking, it was escape from him. He was back. Your Honours, the state action 
suffers from constitutional infirmities in the parliaments. Lastly, I honor one of the main issues that we believe that the respondents have failed to understand and failed to address in the written submission as well. While under the ambit of right to life and dignity, we do believe the state has a positive obligation to protect its citizens, it cannot do so at the cost of stripping an individual away of his basic dignity and freedom rights. Your Honours, in reference to which I would like to make three brief submissions. First, the state arbitrarily invoked the laws in the current case. Your Honour Justice Paul in 2017 with the Swami judgment clearly when observing in reference to the constitutional uh, procedural safeguards held that when they bypass constitutional authorities, it is essentially preventing an individual from determining what safeguards are available to them. In the current case, the National Security Act has been arbitrarily invoked or rather an extrajudicial authority which is often misused as a political tool by the state for a simply for raising a voice for protest over what we need. More importantly, Your Honours, the grounds of punishment for detaining a person under this act have been so ambiguous in nature. We see page 5, paragraph 20 of the proposition. It states the words incorrect information and false information. Your Honours, what comes under the act of incorrect or false information is left ambiguous and an ordinary citizen will not ever realize the information they share will fall under these categories. Your Honor, this was also an effect that causes a chilling effect that causes upon the individual's right to freedom of speech and expression, something that the courts at Shreya Singh have requested. More importantly, Your Honor, with reference to the application of sedition laws, which we believe is a much futile exercise, considering Your Honor, I will just seek an extension of one minute. Much better. Your Honor, in reference to sedition, the Supreme Court in a recent 2022 judgment, S.G. Mumbai v. Kuru Nafira, clearly held that all sedition cases, that is under section 124A of the IPC, are to be kept in abeyance until the constitutionality of the law is looked after. The Honor is expected in the current case as redundant, as clearly stated in paragraph 8C of the judgment, that all existing cases are put on hold and new cases shall not be registered. Lastly, Your Honor, there was an excessive use of force by the state upon the local government. While we do not condemn the use of force, we believe that the degree of force used was excessive in nature. Article 5 of the UPF clearly states that no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. The honors the police could use reasonable force, but in the current case, they have gone to, as stated on paragraph 16 of the proposition, they have gone to brutally beat up the locals. The honors simply because an individual is protesting does not serve as justification enough to subject them to such cruelty. This excessive use of force was unwarranted and strips the individual away from his basic dignity and human rights. Therefore, Your Honours, the state action was violated for basic human rights for the reasons. With this, Your Honour, I come towards an end of my submissions. And if I may move towards the floor. Just to go back, you seem to argue that this debate with law and order situation is one and public order one. You also seem to argue that the initial problem was localized, only on the northern side of the river. Yes, sir. But we all know that internet can travel in seconds across continents. So there was a high possibility that these TikTok things, or top things as you call it, may reach from Fitbit to any part of the world in more time, just in seconds. So if that is taken into consideration by the state, and then couple it with the ambiguity or non-availability of the definition of temporal in the other act to that point. Yes, sir. So if the state felt that perhaps this can catch fire somewhere else, because it's available everywhere. Very well. So about this, if you have any submission. Yes, sir. So essentially in such a situation, the state should have adopted a less restrictive measure, which is also equally effective, something that the Union of India has done in multiple situations as well. And what I mean by less restrictive is that first, we have deviated services, which the Union of India had done during the farmers' protest in the inner circle of Delhi, where they simply deviated the services rather than suspending internet services completely. So your answer is degradation of services could have been considered. Yes, sir. 
Additionally, they could have taken up targeting coffee, which is like open source. Yes, we can move. Your Honor, therefore, in light of the facts stated, issues raised, arguments advanced in the court of the it is most strongly clear before this honorable court that the deputy please to quash the executive order issued by the Indian government of Ampro for it being ultra virus to Article 14, 19.1a, 19.3, and 21 of the Constitution. Second, quash the government order issued by the state government of Fitbit for it being arbitrary and illegal. And third, declare the state government of Fitbit's act as violating the basic human rights of the citizens of it. And pass any order in favor of the petitioner, which this court will be with in ends of equity, justice, and democracy. Over the honor of the United States. You are very well. Council solicits permission to collectively address the bench as your lordship. Yes. Today, we represent the respondent, the Union of AMPRO, in the AMPRO People's Association versus the Union of AMPRO as under Article 32 of the Constitution of AMPRO. In light of the contentions raised by the petitioner, the respondent will be countering the petitioner in thinking about that the internet ban was perfectly constitutional and well within the purview of powers granted to the government in a time span of 16 minutes and my co-counsel will be dealing with the fact that the ban of the crisscross app was in national interest and valid in a time span of 14 minutes. If your lordship is well versed with the facts, the council would directly like to proceed with the issues. Now, the uh, petitioner did not particularly argue the maintainability of the petition as under Article 32 of the Constitution. But it is being brought about by the respondent that the petition brought forth by the petitioner is not maintainable owing to two aspects. There has been no exhaustion of local remedies. Coming uh, to the fact that in the case of Onkar uh, Lal Nehru versus the state of Rajasthan, it was stated that doctrine of exhaustion of alternative remedies is the guiding force between the exercise of power granted by the law. In this case, the order dealing with the internet ban was passed by the state government as brought about in paragraph 20 of the moot proposition. And thus, the High Court could have been approached first as under Article 226. Secondly, in case of the banning of the crisscross app, in a similar factual scenario, when the app of TikTok was banned, the Madras High Court was approached, who indeed approved uh, 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 who indeed upheld a nationwide ban of the TikTok app owing to pornographic content, which was later, uh, which was later also uh, uh, removed and then imposed by the union government. But th this also proves the fact that a high court has the power under their purview to impose a ban, nationwide ban on an app. Secondly, there is no direct infringement of fundamental rights through the banning of the crisscross app on the petitioner per se. The petitioner has argued that a number of crisscrossers will lose their livelihoods as under Article 19.1g. And for freedom of speech, a multiple the people or the crisscrossers will not be able to express their opinion. Now, this is what impacts them and not the petitioner per se, which is why the respondent brings in the contention that the writ petition is not maintainable, that is brought about by the petitioner, but assuming maintainability, council would like to start, start with the first term that the internet ban was perfectly constitutional as brought about by the government. So, owing to the fact uh, that it was uh, under the powers granted to the government as under Article 14, 19, and 21, 
and it falls under the purview of powers granted to the government under the temporary suspension of telecom services public emergency or public safety rules 2017 which will be referred to as the suspension rules here and after for ease of communication starting off with my submissions coming to article 14 your lordship it was brought about in the landmark case of ep oyappa versus state of tamil nadu by a five judge bench in 1973 by the supreme court there was in that article 14 there was a new dimension laid to article 14 your lordship that it, even though it is a guarantee against the arbitrariness brought against state action but it may not be termed arbitrary if it is based on rational and relevant factors now your lordship i would like to direct you to paragraph 16 and 17 of the moot proposition that is being brought about now in this scenario your lordships the in uh, there were instances of violent clashes external aggression houses being burned people being killed it was only in response to these exigent circumstances that the internet ban was imposed in order to safeguard lives security and public order in fitbit and it cannot be deemed arbitrary or of excessive nature beyond what is required in the interest of public safety which is also a requirement of article 19 and the imposition of reasonable restrictions which was brought about in the case of chintaman rao versus state of madhya pradesh as also given in page 25 of the compendium on behalf of the respondent if your lordships are satisfied with my arguments with respect to article 14 being followed with respect to the given order council would now like to proceed to the internet ban being constitution as under article 19 highly obliged your lordship now reasonable restriction connotes that the limitation imposed on a person in enjoyment of a right should not be arbitrary or of excessive nature in in terms of article 19 it is also contended and it was brought about by the petitioner that there has been a contravention of article 19 1a which deals with freedom of speech and expression and article 19 1g which deals with the freedom to practice uh, trade and profession now article 19 1a as i stated the case of chintaman rao versus madhya pradesh on page 25 of the compendium on behalf of respondents brings about that Article 19 one a can be restricted by Article 19 sub clause two of the Constitution, which for reference has been brought about in page eight of the compendium. The ingredients of Article 19 sub clause two deal that of the of the freedom of speech can be restricted in a scenario where it may be in furtherance of interests of the sovereignty, sovereignty and integrity, security of the state. friendly relations with foreign states public order decency or morality in relation to contempt of court defamation or incitement of offence now coming to the scenario at hand your lordship it can be seen that it was essential to preserve the security of the state owing to the attack that was brought about by manchow who captured hundreds of kilometers of the fitbit territory and also resulted in the death of 10 soldiers of amplo now in this scenario the petitioner stated that only 40% of the territory of uh, of fitbit was captured by manchow but in as a counter to that the council would like to bring about that 40% is a substantial number and the territory that was captured by the state of uh, of the state of fitbit by manchow is something that is of great concern and does concern the security of the state which is a justifiable reasonable restriction as under article 192 additionally it can also be contended that the ban was essential to maintain public order as the situation had deteriorated significantly with the breakdown of law and order violent clashes and had resulted in threats to lives and property now the petitioner your lordship in this scenario came in and said that there is three concentric circles as brought about in the case of ram manohar loya versus state of bihar the largest one being of law and order the smaller one being of public order now it was also laid down in the case of ram manohar loya versus state of bihar that public order 
that law and order may be affected by a mere contravention of law and public order comes into play when the society at large is affected. In this case, the council would like to bring about that the scenario of women being raped, houses being burned, is not a situation that is a mere contravention of law and order. And what has come into play is that the public order has significantly deteriorated in this scenario. And it is also something that concerns the security of the state, nullifying the contention of the petitioner that the reasonable restriction as under Article 19 sub clause 2 can be applied. Also, on the ground of preventing incitement or commission of an offence. Now, um, the very objective of the order was to halt the dissemination of harmful content and misinformation through the internet, which exacerbated the crisis further and led to further offences. The order can thus be deemed constitutional since under Article 19 sub clause 2, three of the six grounds laid for reasonable restrictions have been met to restrict Artic 9, the Article 19 one sub clause A of freedom of speech and expression. Coming to the next art leg of Article 19, Article 19 1G brought about. Article 19 1G has also been restricted to some extent by the government. The respondent would like to bring about that this again is not being done disproportionately and can be restricted for the interest of the general public as under Article 19 sub clause 6. Again, owing to the factual scenario brought about above, this is a case of national and general interest of the general public. Since the situation is out of hand, it is volatile. The government, as brought about in paragraph 16, has deployed the police. There have been multiple clashes between the police and the people, as in paragraph 14 of the Moot Proposition. Additionally, the internet ban has been entailed on e-banking services, has not been entailed on e-banking services, hospital services, and government websites. And thus it cannot be classified as particularly restrictive. It is imperative, Your Lordship, to prioritize the life of people over businesses and income. Because what comes first is the lives of people. If they are not there, how will a business reasonably even function? If Your Lordships are satisfied, uh, Council would now like to proceed to the submissions of Article 21 and how the test of proportionality which the petitioner stated has not been met, has indeed been met in the given scenario. How do you like your options? Now, your options, it has been brought about in page 7 of the memorial on the behalf of the respondents. I submitted that as under Article 21 and the proportionality test laid down in the landmark case of KS Puttu Swami and another versus Union of India, by the Supreme Court in a nine-judge bench back in 2017, there was a four-pronged test laid down by Justice Sikri to determine proportionality of a measure. This has also been brought about your lordship in page 16 of the compendium. And the four-pronged test laid down had also been stated by the petitioner. A measure restricting a right must have a legitimate goal. It must be a suitable means of furthering the goal. There must be a less restrictive but equally effective alternative. And fourthly, the measure must not have a disproportionate impact. The counsel for the respondent will bring about how all four prongs have been met and the measure restricting the internet by the government is perfectly constitutional. The legitimate goal is the regulation of the spread of fake news and thus prevention of incitement of violence, which is definitely out of hand. The petitioner has trivialized the violence up to an extent and stated that it is just a mere contravention of the law and order situation. Law and order situation may come into play where even there is a theft in a house, the law and order situation, this was brought about in the case of Ram Manohar Loya versus State of Bihar. The law and order situation is hampered. But in this case, it can clearly be implied that the situation is more serious and the public order situation has been affected. Additionally, the internet ban was an effective means for the same, as, uh, as also stated by Mr. Lordship in their question asked to the petitioner. The internet is the fastest medium to spread any sort of information through continents and now even across planets with the expansion of the world. But in this scenario, council would like to bring about 
that internet ban is the best way to prevent spread of fake news. It has been established that at a time when the security of the state and public order is under risk, there is no other viable alternative. It can be seen that there was an enemy country who had attacked into the state of Fitbit. There were internal disturbances. In this scenario, it can be seen as the best alternative and the ban cannot be seen disproportionate as essential services such as government websites, e-banking services and hospital services were still run. Uh, this counters again the contention raised by the petitioner that the, it was not proportional, the measure taken of the internet. What do you have to say about uh, the restrictive measures that could have been taken? I would uh, take question, repeat your question or what did you mean by this? What is uh, uh, the petitioner's counsel that argue that you could have taken restrictive measures? In the sense you could have first seen it, uh, reduce the capacity then uh, reduce the speed or whatever they had to say about it, uh, see it for 15 days, then given a break, had to probably see it, give it another time instead of having a continuous ban. And the second point is, what would you have to say about the loss that uh, would be uh, occurred by the internet companies? It's a humongous loss. What would you do about it? Now your Lordship, how would you compare it with the maintainability? Now your Lordship, I would like to ask this in a two-prong manner. Uh, in a two-pronged answer, thank you for the question. Firstly, the ban may be as suggested by the petitioner, there could be an alternative suggested for the ban to be lifted. But I would like to direct your lordships to page 36 of the compendium on behalf of the respondent. This is an order passed by the government of Manipur. Now, it is a well-known fact that Manipur is under an internet ban. And it was only for a span of four days. I would request the bench to grant me an extension of yes. five minutes to complete my submissions in effective manner and counter what has been said by the petitioner. Now, the Manipur order was passed by the government for lifting the internet ban. But as soon as the internet ban was lifted, within a span of two days, there was a picture that was circulated and the ban stopped and the violence erupted again, owing to which the Manipur government had to impose the ban. This is the primary reason as to why an internet ban being there for 15 days, being removed for 5 days is not a very viable alternative since it will not lead to complete removal or complete eradication of the violence which is the primary objective and which is what the state has also, uh, state also wants. Now I would like to just also bring about your lordship that in this scenario it is not in the interest of the state either to bring about multiple continuous orders since the economy of the state is also being impacted. And as a counsel for the respondent, uh, there can be an affidavit submitted that when the state deems necessary, the situation is under control, the internet ban will be lifted. Additionally, the, about the continuous orders, since I am on that wrong, I would like to present another aspect. The petitioner came in to say that this was, the continuous orders are unconstitutional. As per the amended temporary suspension rules of 2020, Rule 2, sub clause 2A, allows for 15 days of suspension order as in and is well under the purview of law. Now, in this scenario, also in the case of Anuradha Basin, it was stated that an order under temporary suspension rules may not be extended indefinitely. In this scenario, it can be seen in paragraph 20 of the mood proposition. I would like to read it out. It is necessary and expedient to order the temporary suspension of internet services in the state for a period of 15 days. This order has been extended in the state of Fitbit time and again. It is only an order of 15 days which is being extended in the state of Fitbit. And there is no order that has been extended indefinitely which makes it perfectly constitutional in the temporary suspension rules. Additionally, since I am dwelling with the temporary suspension rules, it is brought about in the written submissions of the respondent that the uh, temp, uh, order has not been passed by a competent authority. A competent authority in this scenario, as brought about in Rule 2 sub clause 1 of the temporary suspension rules, is the Home Secret Secretary of State Government in charge of the Home Department. In this case, it has been written that the State Government passed the order. 
and since it cannot be assumed that it was not, since the facts are silent your lordships it cannot be particularly assumed that the order was passed by the uh, the order was passed by the uh, uh, secretary of state in charge of the home department it cannot be assumed the inverse also that it was not passed by him. that uh, leads me to state another contention of the petitioner being invalid since it cannot be assumed that it was not passed by a competent authority and since i am delving on the temporary suspension rules counsel would like to bring about another aspect here the petitioner said that the order it is a uh, requirement as under 2 sub clause 6 of the suspension rules as also applied by the petitioner that the order must be in consonance with section 5 sub clause 2 of the telegraph act now in this scenario counsel would like to direct uh, the bench to page 21 of the compendium on behalf of the respondent sir in this scenario it is brought about and i will read it out the bare act of the section 5 sub clause 2 of the telegraph act on occurrence of any public emergency or in interest of public safety the central or state government the rest of the order i would just like to bring about this phase the means of communication may be restricted in this scenario in paragraph 20 of the moot proposition it is being brought about in a very clear manner that this step has been taken to um in light of maintaining public safety which is also a requirement under section 5 sub clause 2 of the telegraph act an order may be passed under section 5 sub clause 2 of the telegraph act banning the internet or restricting the means of communication which has been done to maintain public safety and it has been brought about with the government in the order itself that this is important additionally council would like to bring about one more aspect it was it has been contended by the petitioner in the written submission that rule 2 sub clause of the suspension rules brings about that the order must be one issued in an unavoidable circumstance and must be necessary in this scenario I would not like to take too much time on the court and briefly just state what I have stated earlier for the brevity of the sake for the sake of brevity that the exigent circumstances are enough to prove that the situation was unavoidable with an external attack, rapes, people dying, women being killed, people being killed. This is not a situation that can be managed. That it was not being managed, being able to manage by central forces either, and thus the internet ban can be deemed necessary. Additionally, it has also been brought up. Mr. Counsel, you are on extension. Indeed, Your Lordship, I would just like to conclude my submissions by pointing out. Can I just, uh, Your Lordship, point out that the sedition and NSA are also not outside the purview of all the contentions raised by the petitioner, or should I conclude my submission? Just briefly, Your Lordship. Indeed. Now it was stated uh, there were some grounds for sedition stated, and that this is unconstitutional. Council would like to briefly bring about two aspects: that sedition has not been imposed on anyone. It is the ethos of the court, as under Article 32 of the Constitution of India, to only approach the court when there has been a violation of fundamental rights, and not a mere presumption of a violation of fundamental rights. And the grounds given out for sedition, as in the order stated, are not restrictive, and in any way they do not mean that sedition will be imposed on the person, and it is. Mainly a warning, and is also perfectly constitutional as has been held in multiple judgments of the Supreme Court. Owing to the paucity of time, I would request, I would like to call my co-counsel over for the submission dealing with the banning of the Chris Cross app. It was an honour arguing before this court. Yes,
council solicits permission to begin with the submission. Yes. The Lordship Armed Council Number 2 on behalf of the respondent, the Union of Armed Group. And I will be addressing the question 2 presented before this honorable group, that is whether the nationwide ban of the crisscross application is void <coughs> of Article 191A, 191G, 14 and 21 of the Constitution. The Lordship the Council submits that these rights are not violated in the instant case because of two primary reasons. Firstly, that the restriction is a reasonable restriction. And second, that the action taken by the government is well within its authority. The Lordship addressing the first reason, it is submitted that the rights which are being claimed by the petitioner are not violated in the instant case because there are reasonable restrictions. And I will be addressing the each facets of these rights in phase manner. Your Lordship, addressing to Article 19, it is submitted that 19.1a, indeed we agree that it provides the freedom of speech and expression and it's a basic <coughs> human right. Article 19.1g provides for trade and right to trade and commerce and occupation. However, in the instant case, the ban on the application does not impugnes upon these rights because it passes the test of reasonability. Your Lordship, I would request the court's attention to page 13, para 33 and 34 of the memorandum of respondent. Yes, yes, can your Lordship listen to me? Your Lordship, with respect to the test of proportionality, there is no definite test. However, through judicial precedent, for instance, in state of Madras versus EG Road, the court has provided broad parameters which need to be kept in mind in order to ascertain whether a restriction is reasonable or not. Your Lordship, the first parameter is the circumstances under which the restriction has been imposed. Your Lordship, in the instant case, the ban on application was imposed under the condition only when the, even the central forces were not able to control the situation. It went to such an extent which shows the gravity of the situation. Further, Your Lordship, the ban was imposed when the Manchao actually attacked in the country. Your Lordship, the council, are, uh, the council from the petitioner side are submitting that they, uh, they are only trying to show one-sided picture. That is, the app was banned merely for the public order only. However, I would request Honorable Court's attention to para 19 of the fact sheet. Your Lordship, para 19 of the fact sheet clearly states that there were two reasons for banning the app. First, with respect to the public order in the state of Fitbit, and second, with respect to the data theft and data stealing by the state of Punjab. Your Lordship, in my further submission, I will be addressing each of these two reasons while making arguments. Your Lordship, with respect to the second meter, uh, second parameter with, uh, with respect to the test of reasonability, uh, reasonability it is submitted. Then the second parameter is that the court should ascertain the social setting of a country. Your Lordship, the social setting of a country is clear from the fact that people believe on a talk meet shared by one of the user and they came on road fighting for it. Which means that the social setting of the country was not of such a nature that people could be understood, could be presumed to have very long and very expend, like, extended nexus and rationality to complement each and everything. Which means in a, such a situation, there needs to be a supervision by the government in order to ensure that these information do not mislead people and it will it compel them to come on board and fight for it. The Lordship, the third parameter with respect to the test of reasonability is the, that the court should ascertain the burning problem of the day and the employment of least restrictive but equally effective measure. The Lordship, the primary duty of the state is to protect the life of the citizens. I would request you to kindly refer para 16 of the fact sheet. Yes. The Lordship, the facts without any ambiguity are on the face clear that houses were burned, women were publicly raped, people were killed, there were ethnic clashes, which means almost more than 50% of the community were involved in these clashes. In such a situation, citing it as only a mere law and order situation would not prevent the government to control because it is the, ultimately the government which has to be answerable to the largest citizens. Secondly, your lordship, with respect to the available, uh, effective and uh, equally effective and uh, remedy. We also we do agree to the fact that there are alternative remedy. However, they are not effective in the present case. We also the least effective, less effective measure as suggested by the petitioner also could have been bringing down the specific content or such a thing. However, if these 
stand would have been taken the app which is being used by the uh, mancha which is an enemy country they would create several other accounts if the one proxy server other proxy server can be created so just to put an end on this situation control the a complete ban on the app was necessary therefore the government action is justified in this if that satisfies the question, the council would like to move with the argument related to Article 14. Your Lordship, addressing Article 14 of the Constitution, it is submitted that we agree that Article 14 allows for equal treatment. However, as per State of West Bengal versus Anwar Ali Sarkar, unequal treatment is allowed if twin conditions are met. Firstly, there must be an intelligible differential, and second, there must be a rational nexus with the option. Your Lordship, in the instant case, the rationale behind banning crisscross app only and excluding other application is because the government of Amro received a positive intel that Manchao, which is an enemy neighboring country, has is using this platform to create bot apps and instigate violence. Your the petitioner might come and argue and in their rebuttals that it is only a mere presumption and the government is actually claiming only press release. However, that is not true and it is very clear from the chronology of the plan. And I would request Honorable Court with me to follow those facts in the fact sheet. Your Lordship, in the fact sheet, para 15, it mentions that In Para 15 of the fact sheet, it mentioned that it, because of the one read on the app, violence, start, violence actually exacerbated. Further, in Para 17, it clearly mentioned that taking advantage of this grave situation, the Manchao actually attacked. In Para 8 also, Your Lordship clearly stated, I would read, that the political and social environment in Fitbit has remained volatile. Ampro has believed and have in past gathered tangible proof that Manchao regularly supplies weapon and drug to the populace in Fitbit in order to in, uh, in order to deteriorate the law and order situation of the state. Which means that Manchao had been behind this app and thereby banning of the app was necessary and therefore it finds an intelligible difference here to specifically target this app. Yes. So why, why couldn't you also ban the other apps? Because that could have been done through other apps as well. What is your answer to that? In video options. Your options? First of all, I will be addressing you in a two form. Right? Yes. The first one is the positive form. You know, if we go and ban every other app, this would be impugning upon the rights of the freedom of speech and expression, which the government is supporting actually. And thereby we have only targeted one app. With respect to the another argument, your logic, we have banned this very app only because of the twin reason. It is not just the public order aspect, it is also the respect due aspect due to the data theft and the data stealing. In Lordship, this app is being used by the whole of Ampro. Ampro is the second largest population country in the world. If the data of these many citizens could have been used and transmitted to some enemy country, it would create a havoc. And therefore, it was a pressing urgency to ban an app. Is that satisfies your option? Yes. Hi, Your Lordship. Your Lordship, further, the ban was imposed with an objective to control the public order situation also. And therefore, it finds a rational access to it. Now, you know, Chip, coming to the prompt of Article 21. You know, Chip, Article 21, the very bare clearly mentions that, that it is the duty of the, although the interpretation is that it is the duty of the state to protect the life and liberty of citizens. All the rights arising from it, that is the livelihood as held in all the ten states. These are secondary. If life cannot be held, other rights cannot assume, can be assumed. You know, sir, with respect to Article 20, it is mentioned that the test of proportionality needs to be employed in order to ascertain whether the restrictions are proportionate to the aim which the government is trying to achieve. You know, sir, in case Kutu Swami versus Union of India, four four tests have been provided. These four four tests are actually fulfilled in the instant case. You know, sir, with respect to the first test, it is mentioned that there must be a legitimate aim, which in the present case is to control the public order to save safeguard the data of the citizen. And this is an undisputable fact. Second test, you know, sir, with respect to the case put to Swami, is that there must be a suitable means of furthering this goal. And the means adopted must be effective in achieving the goal. Your Lordship, in the present case, the ban is an effective way to control this goal because this would keep and, and <coughs> stop 
one of the penetrating arm of the state of Mancha, which is an enemy country. The logic, the third test, is that there must not be any less restrictive means to achieve the objective. The logic, the government did take other measures, and it was when these measures failed. For instance, if the central forces were not all able to control the situation, then the ban was in place. The last test is that that the measure must not have a disproportionate impact. The logic, this is a very important part of the test, and it almost covers the whole gist of the test. For which I would request you to kindly refer page eight of the compendium. Yes. Yes. The page eight presents the bare text of the Constitution, Article 19.6, where the wording that is mentioned and we have seen highlighted in interest of. The Lordship Justice Subbarao in Superintendent Central Prison of Ram Manohar Lohia has interpreted this phrase as wide in amplitude under which a restriction can be imposed and if a restriction is connected to public order and security of state, which in both the cases the government has provided well within their press release and also through the submission. If these two grounds are present, then these restrictions can be deter can be called to be proportionate and well within the authority and within constitutional spirit. If the Lordship have no further questions, the Council would like to move on to the submission with respect to the second reason. The Lordship, with respect to the second reason, the Council submits that the action taken by the government are well within its power. The Lordship Section 69A of the Information and Technology Act 2000 empowers the government to block online content and websites. The same shall comply with the blocking order 2009 which are the procedural procedures. And in fact, in section in Shreya Sikhar versus Union of India, in para 105 of the judgment, the court upheld the validity of this very section because there were additive measures provided in the blocking rule, which in the present case the government has followed. The also the petitioners have represented uh, the court a very half-sided picture of the law. That is, as per Menka Gandhi, there must be a uh, post factor hearing on the case. However, your Lordship, I would address to the same here that Rule 9 of the Blocking Rule 2000, which calls for the emergency provision. Your Lordship, under the Rule 9, if a complaint is received with respect to such content or app, the, the State Secretary of the Home, Home Affairs can directly ban the app. Further, which a review committee can be formed within 48 hours and then go on to say whether it's an interim ban or a final ban. Your Lordship, it is to be noted that why I mentioned these procedures here, rather than there, there are no instances where there is a chance to be given to the third party for hearing. Also, Your Lordship, if the petitioners, uh, uh, Your Lordship, the councils is a upper extension of two minutes to three minutes. The notion that petitioners are claiming that there is no option given to the third parties. The question now arises is that the, it's an NGO and why they are fighting for the right to be heard for a third party that is the app itself. Which means in the instant case, the, uh, the respondent have actually followed all the procedure and it was the interest of the citizen and as well as the state, the ban was imposed and the whole uh, Procedure as well as the constitutional states were upheld by it. Uh, with that, if the government does not have questions, the council will like to move to the next. Wherefore, in light of the question presented, argument advanced, and authority cited, it is humbly prayed that this honorable court may be pleased to hold that the order dated 5th July and the continuation order passed by the state government of Frederick are not arbitrary and illegal, hold that the nationwide ban of the Christmas application is not violated of Article 191A, 191G, Article 14 and 21 of the Constitution and pass any other order this may court deem fit in the interest of justice, equity and good consign, all of which is humbly clear. It was an honor to argue with this honorable court. Greetings to the bench again. Your Honor, the respondent state had contended that we did not argue maintainability. However, the written submission does not contain an issue of maintainability, whereas our written submissions are preemptively 
address the aspect of unity and ability. The rules of the competition say that the arguments should be confined to the memorials and can't travel beyond the extent of the written submissions. Even then, I'd like to address that aspect. Firstly, Your Honor, the traditional rule of locus standa is relaxed in cases of public interest litigation by, as held by the court in S.P. Gupta. Moreover, in Arna Brunson and Goswami as the state of Maharashtra, this court along with the High Court has concurrent jurisdiction to hear writ matters when it comes to violation of fundamental rights. And the but, um, respondent state also contended that the High Court would have been approached given that the suspension of the internet was more of a local issue. But we also have to understand that there is a twin challenge of the ban also, and that has national implications and to prevent multiplicity of proceedings in various high courts, it is required that we approach the Supreme Court. With regard to the internet ban, Your Honor, we did not contend that it is not passed by a competent authority. We contended the nature of the order itself, using terms like fake news, misinformation, which are politically contested terms. Reminds me of a quote that Justice Gautam Patel had said, who would fact check the fact checker? That's the government itself. The government is the arbiter of truth. The government's version of truth can always be contested. Your Honor, another important thing that the respondent failed to understand is that internet is a bouquet of rights. If, may, if I may borrow, this is Chandrasekhar's phrase uh, in the same sex marriage judgment. And it's a derivative right recognized under international conventions and by Fahima Shari, who is the state of Kerala. With regards to the app ban, Your Honor, we did not with regards to the data privacy concerns, we said that the Data Protection Act itself provides for an investigative mechanism that the state could have resorted to. Moreover, there were lesser restrictive measures which have worked effectively in terms of public uh, disorder. For example, money court, the intermediary was asked to put a disclaimer of those information which was false, misleading, or which had uh, obscene content or disturbing content. And Rule 9.1 is contended by the petitioner, by the respondent state, Your Honor. The legislative intent is that it must be an interim measure and not an indefinite measure in the present case. That brings me to the end of my rebuttal. It was a pleasure arguing before this court. audience members to kindly remain seated while we escort the judges to the green room. They will return shortly after this calling and deliberation. Thank you. Karim Chawla was one of the finest legal luminaries to have graced this coveted profession. Justice M.C. Chawla, a former statesman, ambassador, and cabinet minister, was a man of great ideals and morals. His lordship was the first Indian Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court and a former professor of constitutional law at Government Law College, Mumbai. In the words of H.M. Sirbai, in his letter about Chief Justice Chawla, his lordship was always his lordship always had a smile for all and a frown for none. And the bar under his tenure as Chief Justice would never have become what it did 
without his great self discipline and natural kindness of heart we the mood court association of government law college mumbai would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to the chief justice mc chagla memorial trust for letting us play a small part in playing tribute to his lordship by hosting this competition in association with us for 30 years now the mc chagla memorial national mood court competition is one of the most coveted mood court competitions in the country over the past 30 years this competition has grown in it has grown in size and stature being elevated to a ninth national level competition since its 18th edition we host students from the best law schools in the country with the quality of participation refining with each passing edition we now like to call upon our professor in charge mrs nizam sheik to deliver a welcome address to our guests and audience for the evening We yeah, are respected principal Dr. Asmita Vedya, Honorable Justice Riyas Chagla, Bombay High Court, Honorable Justice Mr. Kamal Khata, Bombay High Court, Honorable Justice Mr. Milin Sathai, Bombay High Court, respected faculties and my dear students, I, on behalf of Government Law College Mumbai and M C Chagla Memorial Trust, I congratulate all the participants, without whom. This competition would not have reached this height of success. On 27th October 2023, in the first session, we had a panel discussion which had given an opportunity to all the students and audience to witness and experience the views and the opinions of the subject experts and the panelists who had presented their stands with prudent and logical reasoning and thinking, making it. versatile deliberation in understanding the core issues related to the topic of discussion the frequent internet blackouts protecting national interest or suppressing free speech on 20th october 2023 that is today in the semi final rounds in the afternoon session the final rounds in the evening session were conducted very smoothly and effectively by the volunteers as we all know mc chagla memorial trust in association with the government law college mumbai has organized this 30th mc chagla memorial government law college national mood court competition 2023 and we are honored to be associated with mc chagla memorial trust special thanks to honorable justice mr riyas chagla for his constant support theme for our panel discussion and the mood court was an effort to have a dialogue and deliberation on such vital issues of freedom of speech and right to information which forms the basis of any modern democratic state in today's world information is the means of achieving the goals set for striving towards a responsible state accountable towards its people at large the strength of democracy is in preservation and protection of existing diversities of the individuals and the communities the promise to make this nation a real sovereign secular democratic republic based in the freedom guaranteed by the indian constitution freedom of speech and expression is the most vital significant and the essential rights amongst all as and when the state challenges the freedom of its citizens and non citizens under reasonable restrictions under article 19 clause 2 the high court and the supreme court had have always performed the duties as the guardian and the protector of the indian constitution and safeguarded the rights conferred under it so national security had has always been the area of concern and priority for the state and for the citizens too there exists no government without people and no democracy without the freedom of speech and expression so it is always have been we the people of india as the member of law fraternity and a free and responsible society we have a duty towards constitution and stay without prejudice on this note i congratulate all the participants and the winners of this competition 
I thank Dr. Asmita Vaidya Madam, Principal, Government Law College, Mumbai, and the organizing committee for giving me an opportunity to deliver a welcome speech. All the Moot Court Committee members for their continuous efforts in making this event a grand success. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Our dignitaries for today were thoroughly impressed by the fine display of advocacy skills by our finalists. To begin with, we have amidst us our Madam Principal, Dr. Asmita Vaidya, who has been a constant source of guidance and direction to the Moor Court Association. With an MBA in Human Resources Management, Dr. Vaidya pursued her doctoral research in industrial law and completed her PhD in 2009. She started her career as a teacher at the Postgraduate Department of Law, Nagpur University, in 1995. Dr. Vaidya has chaired many technical sessions and delivered many lectures as a resource person on various different legal topics such as cyber law, intellectual property law, <coughs> human rights, women's rights, and surrogacy, to name a few. Madam Principal has authored eight reference books and 40 research articles in different national and international research journals along with more than 100 articles on women's rights published in various newspapers. We would kindly invite our Madam Principal to address the audience. Ma Saraswati Lavandan. Today's guest of honor Honorable Shri Justice Kamal Katha sir, Honorable Shri Justice Sathe sir, Honorable Shri Justice Riya sir, Professor in charge Nuzat Sheikh madam, Chugani madam, other professors who are present here, all the delegates, delegate teams participating in this 30th MC Chagla Memorial Government Law College National Moot Court Competition and my dear students. Very good, good evening to one and all. JLC, as everybody know, has strong legacy and has given freedom fighters, social reformers, social workers, eminent lawyers, learned judges, politicians to the country. It is the oldest Asia's college this college is known for vibrant activity and conducts many activities. From last two years, sir, I would like to tell you that we are conducting the programs, programs after programs that I can say. In the academic year 21-22, we conducted 75 different academic programs absolutely based on the Indian constitution. In the banner of Azadi 75, it included 15 national webinars, 15 national level guest lecture series, 15 national level quizzes, 15 legal awareness programs throughout Maharashtra state and 5 publications. Street Place and we also conducted one international conference on world constitution. In the academic year 22-23, we conducted, you will not believe, 161 programs, which are not only academic but other also, and also included the national and international activities. We could do this only because of the cooperation from the teaching staff, the professor in charge, and enthusiastic participation of GLC students. And therefore, let us put together the hands for the appreciation of the We are striving towards excellence and would like to highlight works done for the enhancement of quality education by the college. I'll just focus a few of them. UGC 12B and 12F uh, certification done. We are undergoing the NAC process. Solar system is already installed in our college. 
Sir, we are very happy to inform you that we have started six different add-on courses for our students, starting from first year to fifth year, and all the students, exclusively of the GLC, they can go for this. We are continuously conducting state level, national level, and international level workshops, seminars, conferences. <coughs> We are also going for academic as well as the administrative audit, bridge courses, an induction program, they are getting organized. We have customary MOUs, we can say, as we have good relations with the trust, though on paper we do not have, but we have signed MOUs with six different uh, NGOs. Then uh, we are also Conducting the guest lectures, it is a conduct. Uh, it is a continuous activity. Panel discussions, we are definitely enjoying it. Our students are enjoying. Under the NSS, we are conducting blood donation camp. Then we are conducting different <coughs> activities like Constitution Day, Human Rights Day, and so on. Women empowerment programs is getting organized by our college. Most importantly, I think this is the first college which is going for academic ISO certification. We have already done it. Another thing which I would like to highlight is from the academic year 22-23, we have started post-graduation course that is LLM course in GLC and we have also opened the research cell that is a student can undergo PhD program from GLC. Government Law College Mumbai, in association with the <laughs> Chief Justice M.C. Chakla Memorial Trust, is pleased to announce this 30th M.C. Chakla Memorial Government Law College <coughs> National Moot Court Competition 2023, which was held, which was started from 8th of October actually, and today we do have this valedictory function. Um, as rightly said by the anchor, that we actually started at local level, then went to the state level and now looking to the response, we shifted to national level and I am very happy that 16 different team, they have participated in this competition at national level. name of MC Chagla and therefore I would like to give a brief introduction of late Mr. MC Chagla sir. He was appointed as the first Indian Chief Justice of Bombay High Court. He also served as Ambassador to USA, Mexico, Cuba, Vice Chancellor of the University of Bombay, High Commissioner to England and Union Minister for Education. Chief Justice M.C. Chagla also served as a professor of constitutional law at Government Law College, Mumbai for a number of years. <laughs> the association is not only for the 30 years, but it is generations together, I must say. He worked tirelessly for the causes of civil liberty, individual freedom and political democracy. And this Woodcourt competition promises to be a fitting tribute to his legacy. Friends, GLC always feel proud for this association with Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Memorial Trust and would like to remain obliged, sir. I appreciate the team participation throughout India. As I said, 16 have participated. Also expresses my deep gratitude towards Honorable Shri Justice Kamal Katha, sir, and Honorable Sathe, sir for sparing their valuable time for us. <laughs> While sitting before, we all were enjoying the arguments made by the team. I congratulate the winners in advance and appreciate their participation. Special thanks to Vidula and her MCA core group and the volunteers for making this event successful.
Thank you, Madam Principal, for those encouraging words. We are honoured to have amidst us Honourable Shri Justice Kamal Khatta and Honourable Shri Justice Milan Sakhe, who presided over the final round of arguments for this competition. Our first judge for the evening, Honourable Shri Justice Kamal Khatta, studied at Mahindra Students Academy and completed his BCom from HR College of Commerce and Economics. His Lordship graduated in law from KC Law College, Mumbai, and enrolled as an advocate in 1993. His Lordship has appeared in matters related to company law, property law, testamentary law, arbitration law, trademarks, trademarks law, writ petitions, and public interest litigation. Justice Khata was appointed as an additional judge of the Bombay High Court in July 2022. I'd like to request Honorable Shri Justice Riyaz Chagla to felicitate Justice Khata. Good evening, everybody. Respected brother Justice Charla, respected brother Justice Sati, respected Dr. Vaidya, principal of this college. Professor Nuzat Sheikh, Ms. Parje, the General Secretary, the Professor Kishu Daswani, I don't think he's here now, I think he's left. All professors, students, and friends. To me, it is an honor and a privilege to be invited for judging this renowned competition. This being the 30th itself speaks volumes. I am really thankful to all the students here at the outset for offering me such a wonderful warm welcome. All standing in the corridors, in the aisles of the college, it was really heartwarming. My heartiest congratulations to all the participants. I say this because to my mind, each student who has participated gains from this competition. It is the participation which is exceedingly important. It is not the winner, it is not the success, but it is solely the participation. Students certainly and certainly in my mind learn and learn a hell of a lot in these kind of moot court competitions. Speaking for myself, I too have learned here. Hearing the arguments here gave me a feeling and I am sure even to my brother judge that we were more like in a courtroom than in college. I must commend all of you for your preparation and the efforts that you all have taken in coming up with some wonderful performance. Fantastic. As students, you all should be grateful to this college, this institution and to the trustees of the MC Chagla Memorial Trust to grant you this platform because as students, not many colleges would have these kind of platforms and they would lack it. But this trust has for 30 times, obviously 30 years, has supported, given an opportunity to students to come forward and participate and thereby improve their learning experiences, appearing before judges, appearing before council, appearing and also participating at their levels, even though it is at a smaller level, the very fact that they participate, coming forward, looking towards going and getting uh, uh, an award 
in such a moot court competition by itself is a fantastic process. We as judges are always very eager to hear very good arguments. From the bar, we always look forward for quality hearings. Today, I did. Really appreciate the manner in which I participate. Really argue. We all liked it. Fantastic. I would earnestly urge all the students who would like to take up practice or even for those who don't want to, to really participate in these competitions. To my mind, moot court competitions are extremely valuable for developing your skills, your legal skills, your research, your case analysis, how you would want to argue, your thought processes, your strategies, and it's a kind of practical understanding of advocacy. Today, I must say that it was extremely difficult to evaluate who was good, who was not. Very good job by all teams. It was a wonderful evening and truly memorable. I once again thank my brother Chagla and Sate for making this evening truly wonderful and memorable. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you for those wise words, Your Lordship. Our second judge for the evening, Honorable Chief Justice Milan Sati, studied at Adarsh Marathi School and Pethe High School and completed his high school education from KTHM College at Nasik. His Lordship graduated as an engineer in electronics and telecommunication from College of Engineering, Pune, as a part of the 1995 batch. His Lordship graduated in law from NBT College, Nasik, and was enrolled as an advocate at the bar in 1999, subsequently joining the chambers of senior advocate V. A. Thorat. His Lordship was also a member of the Advocates Association of Western India. Justice Sati practiced on the appellate side of the Honorable Bombay High Court in civil cases related to property disputes, rent possession, contractual disputes, arbitrations, insurance disputes, and family partition disputes. Justice Sati was elevated as an additional judge of the Bombay High Court in November 2022. I'd like to kindly request our Madam Principal to felicitate his lordship. I'd like to invite Justice Sati to come up and kindly address the audience. I hope there is nobody holding the time placard here. <laughs> Very good evening, Namaskar. My senior brother, Justice Chagla. My senior brother, Justice Khata. Principal, Dr. Asmita Vaidya, Madam. <coughs> the trustees of Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Trust. The <coughs> organizers of the competition, participants, dear students, and the staff of the college, of course, without which it is not possible. <coughs> I am indeed delighted to be part of this MC Chagla Memorial GLC moot court competition. At the outset, I would like to congratulate each one of you for your hard work, determination, and outstanding performances. <coughs> I am sure all the teams must have performed and performed very well, but we had an opportunity of hearing two of the team, best teams, that, to, uh, that in a way to say. And all four or five participants of both the teams have done extremely well. Great congratulations to them. <clears throat> it is indeed a pleasure to stand before aspiring law students 
who are going to shape the legal landscape of tomorrow. Today on the occasion of moot court competition, I would like to share with you a few thoughts of mine about these moot courts. What is a moot court? Moot court is not merely a simulation or imaginary case debate, but it is a practice session of the intellectual rigor, persuasive skills and dedication that collectively <coughs> defines the legal world. Today as we witnessed the culmination of countless hours of research, preparation and teamwork, we also witnessed shaping up of our future legal fraternity. Today I remember a quote from Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam and I quote, excellence is not an accident but a continuous process, unquote. Therefore always remember if you wish to excel, you have to work continuously. I believe that moot court competitions are not just about winning or losing, as also rightly pointed out by my brother, uh, Justice Kata. It is about the invaluable lessons learned in the process. So what did you learn? While researching for your case, you have explored the depths of legal precedents, expanding your knowledge. While debating, you have sharpened your ability to think on your feet and adapting to unexpected challenges that are thrown from the courts. While collaborating with your teammates, you have learned the importance of teamwork and mutual respect. As you move forward in your legal careers, whether as aspiring lawyers, as judges or as scholars, I urge you to carry these lessons learned today. In the pursuit of justice, we must remember that law cannot be taken as a static entity, but it must be understood as a dynamic and ever-evolving thing. In the words of Lord Denning, law is a living organism that evolves with the society adapting to changing needs and circumstances. So, your role as future lawyers is not merely to interpret the law, but also to challenge it, question it, and to advocate for change if it is so necessary. Lastly, I urge all of the students here to always remember the significance of integrity and highest ethical standards even when you are faced with the most challenging situations because it will not only define your character but remember that it reflects on the reputation of the entire legal profession. On this positive note and once again congratulating the uh, both the teams, I will not say only winning team, both the teams for the efforts put in. I wish you all the very best for all your future endeavors. Thank you so much. Jai Hind. Thank you for your wise words, Your Lordship. It is my, it is my pleasure to introduce the trustee of the late Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Memorial Trust, Honorable Sri Justice Riyaz Chagla, sitting judge of the Honorable Bombay High. His Lordship completed his graduation from HR College of Commerce and Economics and graduated from the University of Cambridge Downing College. His Lordship enrolled as an advocate with the Bar Council of Maharashtra and Goa in 1993 and practiced as a counsel at the Bombay High Court for over 23 years. His Lordship also appeared before the Honorable Supreme Court of India and was appointed on the Union Panel in 2009. During his Lordship's practice as a counsel, he appeared in civil, constitutional, commercial, corporate, taxation and testamentary cases. His Lordship was elevated as a judge of the Honorable Bombay High Court in June 2017. We would like to thank Justice Chagla for his unwavering guidance and valuable inputs without which this competition would have been a distant reality. I'd like to request our General Secretary, Ms. Vidula Barze, to felicitate His Lordship Justice Chagla. I would now like to invite his lordship to address the audience. Good evening, everyone here. Uh, uh, Brother Justice uh, Khatta, Brother Justice Sate, <coughs> Principal Dr. Vaidya, professors of this college, uh, students, friends, Mr. Federal, Mr. Shah, all who are here. And uh, it's indeed uh, a privilege for me to be here uh, this is indeed a fitting tribute to my grandfather, the late Chief Justice M.C. Chagla. 
as trustee of the Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Trust, I, I also speak for the other trustees who are not here today, but they are indeed a support for this national mood court competition. As Dr. Vaidya mentioned in her, in her opening, that this competition has grown from strength to strength. It started off as a city mood court competition, then a state, and now, and I, I, I shouldn't say now, because for a few years now, it's been a national mood court competition. It attracts students from different parts of the country and, and from all the leading colleges everywhere. And uh, I, I would just like to congratulate all the participants because in the moot court competitions, there are 16 colleges participating. And now we have had a hybrid system where the earlier rounds are held through video conferencing and we have the semi-finals and finals which are in person. Uh, this is just growing with the times and especially because of the COVID pandemic, it has taught us so much to use technology. Technology is used not only in colleges, but even in the courts. We are growing, in, uh, we, we are growing familiar with technology. In fact, now we have e-filing, which has begun from January of this year, and all the judges are making an attempt to utilize e-filing. We have our iPads where we refer to case, cases which are all available on the iPads, which especially those which are filed in, in 2023. Uh, in fact, even the, the council who appear in court, they, they just carry one iPad. They, they, don't have, uh, they don't have briefs, physical briefs. So in fact, the pewns have also kind of become redundant. <laughs> So, I, I would just like to say that uh, one should utilize technology. Well, uh, uh, we are very closely associated with the Government Law College. In fact, coming here is like coming home. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's actually um, a college which my grandfather used to lecture in constitutional law. So, we, so our family has had, uh, uh, it's deep rooted in our family. Um, I, didn't, I didn't belong to this college, but my wife didn't, did. She graduated from the Government Law College. In fact, she was a colleague of Justice Khata. They were, they were together in college. And uh, Justice uh, Puniwala as well, but unfortunately, Justice Puniwala is uh, unable to be here because of his ill health. Uh, but uh, um, uh, I, I would have, in fact, liked him also to be one of the judges. In, in this uh, mood court competition. He's, he has just become a judge in June and uh, we are indeed uh, lucky to have him uh, as one of the judges. Well, uh, uh, I would like to, as I said, congratulate all the participants. There has to be a winner and a loser. Uh, today's level was uh, fantastic, as uh, Justice Kata also said, Justice Sati has said. Um, and and uh, as they say, it felt like being in court. It was not like being in a college, but uh, but in court, and and I I certainly felt that as well, sitting in the front row. But I certainly felt that way as well. Uh, this is one competition which I always say that I I don't judge the competition because I like to give a chance to my brother judges to judge the competition. I I am invited to other competitions to judge, but this this competition I always say that I am not going to judge the competition. Um, now, uh, coming to the, uh, the winners, the losers, I, I would like to say that today's round, in fact, and, and especially today's mood problem which was chosen, was very carefully chosen given the current scenario in our, in our country, particularly with regard to Manipur and, and uh, what is faced in Kashmir as well. Because what, what is happening is this is very relevant how uh, blanket bans are imposed, how blackouts are imposed so far as internet is concerned. And internet is definitely a tool which everyone utilizes and especially in this day and age. Um, I, 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 uh, if, I, if I was a judge uh, judging this, I, I would in fact be more inclined towards the petitioners. Because for me, uh, uh, freedom of speech and expression is the most important fundamental right and uh, read with Article 21. But uh, 
you can impose reasonable restrictions. There's nothing to say you can't impose reasonable restrictions. 19.2, all, all that is available. But for the fact is that our machinery should be utilized prior to uh, curtailing fundamental uh, uh, freedom of right and expression, which is, uh, as I said, an integral fundamental right. Well, I, I think all, all the participants today addressed it extremely well, uh, the finalists. And uh, I, would, I would just like to congratulate them. I would wish them the very best. I do hope that they eventually uh, join the bar or, or join a firm or, or ultimately some of them become judges like, like we have. Uh, it's contributing to the society which is the most important thing. As judges, we contribute as much as we can to the society. And uh, I do hope the students here would also endeavor to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your thoughtful words and your constant support, Your Lordship. I'd like to call upon a professor in charge, Mrs. Nuzat Sheikh, to felicitate our Madam Principal now. University Odisha, Maharashtra National Law University Mumbai, National Law University Jodhpur, General Global Law School, National Law University Nagpur, Lloyd Law College, Hidayatullah National Law University, Praveen Gandhi College of Law, Government Law College Mumbai, School of Law Christ, Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law Punjab, Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia National Law University Lucknow, Symbiosis Law School Noida, Dr. D. Y. Patil College of Law, and Gujarat National Law University. A hearty congratulations to all the teams for a laudable presentation of their skills in advocacy and research. We shall now begin with the most awaited segment of today's evening, the Declaration of Results. To begin uh, just before that, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, since uh, me and my brother, Justice Kada, have uh, judged the uh, or presided over our judges, I find it important to clarify that uh, the whoever is the winner or whoever is the runner-up, the decision was not based on the issue heard by us, or it is not a decision on the issue. And I believe Absolutely. Justice Justice Kata would join me with this. Yes, because uh, because uh, the winners are selected on the basis of prefixed parameters, which cover. I mean, which range uh, from the manner, the manner of presentation, the uh, manner in which the answers are given. So the winner or runners-up should not be taken as our judgment on the issue involved. That is the uh, clarification I need to give. Thank you. You can proceed. To begin with, the winner of the award for the best memorial is Team Code H, Praveen Gandhi College of Law. I would like to invite our Madam Principal to kindly present the award for the best memorial.
Congratulations to the team. Moving on, the winner for the award of the second best speaker for the competition is speaker one from Team Code L, Mr. Divyang Devan from National Law Institute of Bhopal. Thank you, Divyang. The winner of the award for the best speaker is speaker 2 from Team Code B, Maharashtra Law University, Mumbai, Ms. Vaishali Khan. I would like to invite Honorable Sri Justice Riyaz Chagla to kindly present the award for the best speaker. Congratulations to the winner. And now, we come to the most anticipated moment of the evening. The winner for the award of the best team goes to Team C, National Law University, Jodhpur. The winner of the award for the second best team is Team Code L, National Law Institute University, Goa. We request Honorable Shri Justice Milind Sake to kindly present the award for the second best team. Congratulations to all the winners of the competition. Ms. Vidula Barze and Ms. General and Ms. Drishti Padravala, the General Secretary and the Assistant General Secretary of the Moorcott Association of Government Law College, have been a constant pillar of support and guidance to this entire committee. The success of this moot can be attributed to their dedication and perseverance. Through their leadership, the Moorcott Association has achieved higher standards of excellence in all our endeavors. I'd like to call upon our General Secretary, Ms. Vidula Barze, to deliver the vote of thanks for this evening. Thank you so much, ma'am. Honorable Shri Justice Kamal Khata, Honorable Shri Justice Milan Jathav, Milan Sathya, Honorable Shri Justice Riyaj Chagla, Senior Counsels of the Bombay High Court, Madam Principal Dr. Asmita Vaidya, Professor in Charge Nuzat Sheikh, Professor Kishu Daswani, faculty members, participants, ladies and gentlemen. It has truly been a privilege for the Moodcourt Association of Government Law College to organize and host this event in the memory of the late Chief Justice M.C. Chagna, one of the greatest legal luminaries to have graced this coveted profession. The growing stature of this event bears testimony to the constant support, encouragement and dedication of a number of people. 
This competition would truly be incomplete without acknowledging the efforts of these individuals. Firstly, on behalf of the Moot Court Association of Government Law College, I would sincerely like to thank Honorable Sri Justice Kamal Khata for spending his valuable time this evening and judging the final round of arguments. We are indeed grateful to His Lordship for his constant patronage and support towards the MCA and GLC. I extend my sincere gratitude to Honorable Sri Justice Milan Sate for his valuable time and his prompt consent to preside over the final round of arguments and the valedictory function of this prestigious competition. We are extremely grateful to this Lordship for gracing us with his presence this evening. The transition from a state level competition to a national level competition and the growing stature of this prestigious moot is truly an outcome of a broad vision of the late Chief Justice M.C. Chagla Memorial Trust. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the trustees of the M.C. Chagla Memorial Trust, Mr. Iqbal Chagla, Mr. Jahangir Chagla, Honorable Sri Justice Riyaz Chagla, retired Honorable Sri Justice B.N. Sri Krishna, Mr. Rashmikan Dakshini, and Mr. Darius Kambada and Sham Belegan to their constant support and dedication towards the success of this competition. We are truly grateful to Mr. Iqbal Chagla, the trustee of the MC Chagla Memorial Trust, for his undying benevolence to the institution. This event would not have been possible without the relentless guidance and the support of Honorable Sri Justice Riyaz Chagla. I would like to thank our Madam Principal, Dr. Asmita Vaidya, for the guidance, direction, and constant support that she has provided to the Moot Court Association and its functioning. I would also like to thank our Professor in charge, Rizal Sheikh, and Professor Kesha Daswani for being a source of inspiration for, and for their continuous encouragement for the student activities in this college. The Moot Court Association is forever indebted to them for their immense support. I must thank Mr. Utkar Srivastava for drafting the case study for this competition. His support, guidance, and dedication to the Moot has been invaluable to us. Further, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the judges for sparing their valuable time in judging the preliminary, quarters, and semi-final rounds of the competition. I would now like to thank the members of the Moot Court Association for their constant devotion towards the success of this competition. In particular, I would like to thank the post holders of this Moot Court Association, Ms. Drishti Patrawala, Ms. Nikhil Padhan, Mr. Karan Nayar, Ms. Nishtha Gada, Mr. Agastya Vijay Raghavan, Ms. Palome Vasarya, Ms. Tanisha Singh, Ms. Disha Sanavne, Mr. Om Kurana, and Mr. Paramyanand. I would additionally like to thank Ms. Sakshi Shetty and Rajvi Veera for their unconditional support in the organization of this competition. The advisory board of Moot Court Association comprising of Ms. Madhvi Doshi, Mr. Feroz Patel, Ms. Shivangi Adani and Mr. Yash Shirankar have been a constant pillar of support and guidance. Their unyielding dedication to the Moot Court Association is irreplaceable and I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to them for their immense contribution. This moot would not have been possible without the constant support of the entire college administration and its staff. Finally, I would like to extend my gratitude to all the teams for participating in this competition. We look forward to hosting you all again, and I truly hope that all the participants have found this to be an enriching experience, and I wish everyone a safe journey back home. Thank you so much. I request everyone to kindly stand up for the state song and the national anthem.
शुभ नामे जागे तब शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तब जय गाथा जन गण मंगल गायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे I request the audience to kindly remain seated while we escort the dignitaries.